Hi, I'm MC Jesse. 大家好，读你听二点零，今日继续读。而家我哋食翻条 scare Donkey Hotte， 读到第十九节。呢节嘅名咧叫做 Of the shrewd discourse which Sancho held with his master, and of the adventure that befell him with a dead body, together with other notable occurrences. 上回咧就讲 Donkey Hotte 同 Sancho 咧。遇見到一啲羊羣啦，咁但係喺當幾多條嘅眼中咧，呢啲羊羣咧係騎士嚟嘅，係一啲可以突進去嘅敵人嚟嘅。咁啊，於是乎咧，唐家德就唔理身做嘅勸告咧，就單槍匹馬衝入去，刺殺咗幾隻羊。咁而呢班牧羊人咧喺驚愕之餘咧，就嗌極，喺當幾多條都嗌唔停。咁唯一個方法咧就係攻擊當幾多條啦，係向佢施以還擊。咁啊，打到江桥一地咧，就牙都甩埋，诶，可以话甩咗一半啦。打到佢满地牙之后咧，以为江桥一地系被打死，于是乎咧就都系走啦，咁啊拉咗啲羊走啦。咁到江桥一地醒翻咧，要帮佢止血啦，吓、啊，又再次帮佢疗伤啦，都真系伤过好多次啦。好，我哋睇下啲字到底发生啲咩事先。跟住我哋交俾 Costa 同大家读嚟听。It seems to me, Senor. That all these mishaps that have befallen us of late have been, without my doubt, a punishment for the offence committed by your worship against the order of chivalry in not keeping the oath you made not to eat bread off a tablecloth or embrace the queen, and all the rest of it that your worship swore to observe until you had taken the helmet of Melandrinos or whatever the moor is called, for I do not very well remember. Thou art very right, Sancho," said Don Quixote. "But to tell the truth, it had escaped my memory." And likewise, thou mayest rely upon it that the affair of the blanket happened to thee because of thy fault in not reminding me of it in time. But I will make amends, for there are ways of compounding for everything in the order of chivalry. Why have I taken an oath of some sort then? It makes no matter that thou hast not taken an oath," said Don Quixote. "Suffice it that I see thou art not quite clear of complicity, and whether or no, it would not be ill done." To provide ourselves with a remedy, in that case," said Sancho, "mind that your worship does not forget this as you did the oath. Perhaps the phantoms may take it into their heads to amuse themselves once more with me, or even with your worship if they see you so obstinate. While engaged in this and other talk, night overtook them on the road before they had reached or discovered any place of shelter, and what made it still worse was that they were dying of hunger." With the loss of the alforjas, they had lost their entire larder and commissariat. And to complete the misfortune, they met with an adventure which, without any invention, had really the appearance of one. It so happened that the night closed in somewhat darkly, but for all that they pushed on, Sancho feeling sure that as the road was the king's highway, they might reasonably expect to find some inn within a league or two. Go along then in this way. The night dark, the squire hungry, the master sharp said. They saw coming towards them on the road. They were travelling a great number of lights, which looked exactly like stars in motion. Sancho was taken aback at the sight of them. Nor did Don Quixote altogether relish them. The one pulled up his ass by the halter, the other his hack by the bridle, and they stood still, watching anxiously to see what all this would turn out to be, and found that the lights were approaching them. And the nearer they came, the greater they seemed. At which spectacle, Sancho began to shake like a man dosed with mercury. And Don Quixote's hair stood on end. He, however, plucking up spirit a little, said, "This, no doubt, Sancho, will be a most mighty and perilous adventure, in which it will be needful for me to put forth all my valour and resolution." "Unlucky me," answered Sancho, "if this adventure happens to be one of phantoms, as I am beginning to think it is, where shall I find the ribs to bear it? Be they phantoms ever so much," said Don Quixote. I will not permit them to touch a thread of thy garments, for if they played tricks with thee the time before, it was because I was unable to leap the walls of the yard. But now we are on a wide plain, where I shall be able to wield my sword as I please. And if they enchant and cripple you as they did the last time, said Sancho, what difference would it make being on the open plain or not? For all that, replied Don Quixote, I entreat thee, Sancho, to keep a good heart, for experience will tell thee what mine is. I will please God," answered Sancho, and the two retiring to one side of the road set themselves to observe closely what all these moving lights might be. And very soon afterwards, they made out some twenty encamisados, all on horseback, with lighted torches in their hands. 
the awe-inspiring aspect of whom completely distinguished the courage of Sancho, who began to chatter with his teeth like one in the coke fit of an ague. And his heart sang, and his teeth chattered still more when they perceived distinctly that behind them there came a litter covered over with black, and followed by six more mounted figures in mourning down to the very feet of their mules, for they could perceive plainly they were not horses by the easy pace at which they went. And as the encamisados came along, they muttered to themselves in a low, plaintive tone, "The strange spectacle at such an hour and in such a solitary place was quite enough to strike terror into Sancho's heart." And even to his masters, and did so, for all Sancho's resolution had now broken down. It was just the opposite with his master, whose imagination immediately conjured up all this to him vividly as one of the adventures of his books. He took it into his head that the litter was a bier on which was borne some sorely wounded or slain knight, to avenge whom was a task reserved for him alone. And without any further reasoning, he laid his lance in rest. Fixed himself firmly in the saddle, and with gallant spirit and bearing, took up his position in the middle of the road where the encamisados must of necessity pass. And as soon as he saw them near at hand, he raised his voice and said, "Halt, knights, or whosoever ye may be, and render me account of who ye are, whence ye came, where ye go, what it is ye carry upon that bier. For to judge by appearances, either ye have done some wrong, or some wrong has been done to you." And it is fitting and necessary that I should know, either that I may chastise you for the evil ye have done, or else that I may avenge you for the injury that has been inflicted upon you. We are in haste," answered one of the encamisados, "and the inn is far off, and we cannot stop to render you such an account as you demand." And spurring his mule, he moved on. Don Quixote was mightily provoked by this answer, and seizing the mule by the bridle, he said, "Halt and be more manly." And render an account of what I have asked of you, else take my defiance to combat all of you. The mule was shy, and was so frightened at her bridle being seized that rearing up, she flung her rider to the ground over her haunches. An attendant who was on foot, seeing the encamisado fall, began to abuse Don Quixote, who now moved to anger, without any more ado, laying his lance in rest, charged one of the men in mourning and brought him badly wounded to the ground. And as he wheeled round upon the others, the agility with which he attacked and routed them was a sight to see. For it seemed just as if wings had that instant grown upon Rocinante, so lightly and proudly did he bear himself. The encamisados were all timid folk and unarmed, so they speedily made their escape from the fray and set off at a run across the plain with their lighted torches, looking exactly like maskers running on some gala or festival night. The mourners too. Enveloped and swathed in their skirts and gowns, were unable to bestir themselves, and so, with entire safety to himself, Don Quixote belaboured them all and drove them off against their will. For they all thought it was no man but a devil from hell come to carry away the dead body they had in the litter. Sancho beheld all this in astonishment at the intrepidity of his lord, and said to himself, "Clearly, this master of mine is as bold and valiant as he says he is." A burning torch lay on the ground near the first man whom the mule had thrown, by the light of which Don Quixote perceived him, and coming up to him, he presented the point of the lance to his face, calling on him to yield himself prisoner, or else he would kill him. To which the prostrate man replied, "I am prisoner enough as it is. I cannot stir, for one of my legs is broken. I entreat you, if you be a Christian gentleman, not to kill me, which will be committing grave sacrilege, for I am a licentiate and I hold first orders." Then what the devil brought you here, being a churchman? Said Don Quixote. What, señor? Said the other. My bad luck. Then still worse awaits you, said Don Quixote. If you do not satisfy me as to all I asked you at first, you shall be soon satisfied, said the licentiate. You must know then that though just now I said I was a licentiate, I am only a bachelor, and my name is Alonso Lopez. I am a native of Alcobandas. I come from the city of Beza with eleven others priests. The same who fled with the torches, and we are going to the city of Segovia, accompanying a dead body which is in that litter, and is that of a gentleman who died in Beza, where he was interred. And now, as I said, we are taking his bones to their burial place, which is in Segovia, where he was born. And who killed him? Asked Don Quixote. God, by means of a malignant fever that took him, answered the bachelor. In that case, said Don Quixote. The Lord has relieved me of the task of avenging his death had any other slain him. But he who slew him, having slain him, there is nothing for it but to be silent. 
instruct one's shoulders. I should do the same were he to slay myself, and I would have your reverence know that I am a knight of La Mancha, Don Quixote by name, and it is my business and calling to roam the world, righting wrongs and dressing injuries. I do not know how that about righting wrongs can be," said the bachelor. For from straight you have made me crooked, leaving me with a broken leg that will never see itself straight again all the days of its life. And the injury you have redressed in my case has been to leave me injured in such a way that I shall remain injured forever. And the height of misadventure it was to fall in with you, who go in search of adventures. Things do not all happen in the same way," answered Don Quixote. It all came, Sir Bachelor Alonso Lopez. Of your going, as you did by night, dressed in those surplices with lighted torches, praying, covered with mourning, so that naturally you look like something evil and of the other world. And so I could not avoid doing my duty in attacking you, and I should have attacked you even had I known positively that you were the very devils of hell, for such I certainly believed and took you to be. As my fate has so willed it," said the bachelor. I entreat you, Sir Knight Errant, whose errand has been such an evil one for me, to help me to get from under this mule that holds me of my legs, caught between the stirrup and the saddle. I would have talked on till tomorrow," said Don Quixote. "How long were you going to wait before telling me of your distress?" He at once called to Sancho, who, however, had no mind to come, as he was just then engaged in loading a sumpter mule, well laden with provender, which these worthy gentlemen had brought with them. Sancho made a bag of his coat, and getting together as much as he could, and as the bag would hold, he loaded his beast, and then hastened to obey his master's call, and helped him to remove the bachelor from under the mule. Then, putting him on her back, he gave him the torch, and Don Quixote bade him follow the track of his companions and beg pardon of them on his part for the wrong which he could not help doing them, and said Sancho. If by chance these gentlemen should want to know who was the hero that served them so, your worship may tell them that he is the famous Don Quixote of La Mancha, otherwise called the Knight of the Rueful Countenance. The bachelor then took his departure. I forgot to mention that before he did so, he said to Don Quixote, "Remember that you stand excommunicated for having laid violent hands on a holy thing. Similarly, if any one, having been persuaded by the devil, I do not understand that Latin," answered Don Quixote. But I know well I did not lay hands, only this pike. Besides, I did not think I was committing an assault upon priests or things of the church, which, like a Catholic and faithful Christian as I am, I respect and revere. But upon phantoms and spectres of the other world. But even so, I remember how it fared with the Ruidias when he broke the chair of the ambassador of that king before His Holiness the Pope, who excommunicated him for the same. And yet the good Roderick of Viva. Bore himself that day like a very noble and valiant knight. On hearing this, the bachelor took his departure, as has been said, without making any reply. And Don Quixote asked Sancho what had induced him to call him the Knight of the Rueful Countenance more then than at any other time. I will tell you," answered Sancho. "It was because I have been looking at you for some time by the light of the torch held by that unfortunate, and verily your worship has got of late the most ill-favored countenance I ever saw." It must be either owing to the fatigue of this combat, or else to the want of teeth and grinders. It is not that," replied Don Quixote, "but because the sage, whose duty it will be to write the history of my achievements, must have thought it proper that I should take some distinctive name, as all knights of yore did. One being he of the burning sword, another he of the unicorn, this one he of the damsels, that he of the phoenix, another the knight of the griffin, and another he of the death." And by these names and designations, they were known all the world round. And so I say that the sage aforesaid must have put it into your mouth and mine just now to call me the Knight of the Rueful Countenance, as I intend to call myself from this day forward, and that the said name may fit me better. I mean, when the opportunity offers to have a very rueful countenance painted on my shield, there is no occasion, Signor, for wasting time or money on making that countenance," said Sancho. For all that need be done is your worship to show your own. Face to face, to those who look at you, and without anything more, either image or shield, they will call you him of the rueful countenance. And believe me, I am telling you the truth. For I assure you, Signor, hunger and the loss of your grinders have given you such an ill-favored face that, as I say, the rueful picture may be very well spared. Don Quixote laughed at Sancho's pleasantry. Nevertheless, he resolved to call himself by that name, and have his shield and buckler painted as he had devised. 
Don Quixote would have looked to see whether the body in the litter were bones or not. But Sancho would not have it, saying, "Señor, you have ended this perilous adventure more safely for yourself than any of those I have seen. Perhaps these people, though beaten and routed, may bethink themselves that it is a single man that has beaten them, and feeling sore and ashamed of it, may take heart and come in search of us and give us trouble enough. The ass is in proper trim. The mountains are near at hand. Hunger presses. We have nothing more to do but make good our retreat." And as the saying is, the dead to the grave and the living to the loaf. And driving his ass before him, he begged his master to follow. Who, feeling that Sancho was right, did so without replying. And after proceeding some little distance between two hills, they found themselves in a wide and retired valley, where they alighted. And Sancho unloaded his beast and stretched upon the green grass. With hunger for sauce, they breakfasted, dined, lunched, and supped all at once, satisfying their appetites with more than one store of cold meat. Which the dead man's clerical gentlemen had brought with them on their sumpter mule, but another piece of ill luck befell them, which Sancho held the worst of all, and that was that they had no wine to drink, nor even water to moisten their lips. And as thirst tormented them, Sancho, observing that the meadow where they were was full of green and tender grass, said what will be told in the following chapter. 唔该晒 Costa， 好，临尾买一买个关子啊。咁呢節呢，就真係正如當叫咗提一直以嚟嘅正能量嘅態度呢，又真係柳暗花明有一串喎、哦。今次遇上嘅呢一班人呢，另一班人嚟嘅又係，咁啊竟然呢，就俾唐吉沃特擊退咗。咁而當叫咗提到最後亦都冇擁護佢自己嘅騎士精神啊，賴死唔走啦。佢都識得得些好意，雖回首啦嚇，即係唔好太過鋒芒不露啦。既然贏咗呢一場仗。都叫做揚名啦，終於都嚇可以拋低自己嘅名號出去啦，咁咧就見好就收啦。好啲節都又有啲字句，其中有一段咧係用拉丁文講咗一個句子嘅，咁我就直接讀出個翻譯文就係、是、Similarly, if anyone having been persuaded by the devil， 咁我就唔讀嗰個拉丁原文啦，因為我都實在係唔識，亦都有陣時揾唔到啲拉丁文嘅發音，甚至乎喺文中咧，故事入面嘅人物咧，佢都講話可唔識拉丁文。揀其他嘅字用大家分享啦 ，larder，larder 呢啲比較簡單嘅名詞嚟嘅 ，l a r d e r，a room or a large cupboard for storing food， 一個食物嘅櫥櫃啦 ，beer。beer 唔係飲嘅啤酒啊，係 b i e r b i e r 都係讀 beer 名詞嚟嘅。Immovable frame on which a coffin or a corpse is placed before burial or cremation, or on which they are carried to the grave。搬去墳地啊，墳墓嘅嗰個靈柩啦，嚇搬過去嘅，即係移動中嘅靈柩啦。Intrepidity, intrepidity, i n t r e p i d i t y。名詞嚟嘅 ，characterized by resolute fearlessness, fortitude, and endurance， 無畏無懼啦，百折不撓啦，一個非常之有氣勢嘅一個狀態。文中提到，唐吉特終於威化一次啦，擊退咗對手啦。而喺阿 Central 嘅眼中咧，當吉特啊，終於都正住佢口中所講，唐吉特自己口中所講，佢自己係如何咁勇猛，佢個 intrepidity。好，今次嚟到呢一度，下一次再嚟一度嚟听，拜拜。If you like this video, make sure to comment, like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Until next time.